So you want to be an architect. What is architecture? Can it exist without a client? Somebody who commissions you to design the buildings? What is the purpose of architecture rather than just building? What could or should be architecture? I'm, I've contributed to writing a book somewhere here called Designing the Profile of the Future Architect and in which I have several essays and that fundamentally invokes the role of the architect in the future as being a servant to society with good morals, good ethics and a real attitude to sharing and collaborating with others to make our world a better place for everyone and everything, the biosphere as a whole. We're going on, experiencing architecture, emotionally experiencing it, experiencing architecture through the media, which is a very strange aspect. We design more and more using a screen, a two-dimensional screen with 3D modeling. But most people experience architecture through journals, through programs like this, through the media. But architecture has to be experienced in its physicality, when all of your emotions, all of your senses are engaged, whether you recognise and are sensitive to them working or not, they are. And that's the experience of real architecture, being there. There's theory and practice. There's quite different worlds. Theory supports architecture. And one can criticise theory in the same way that one can criticise the quality of an architecture that's produced. Architecture should embrace philosophy, ethics and responsibility, values, understand place as well as space, beauty, its role, and the fact that when you're designing, you're designing now for the future, yet your source of inspiration largely and knowledge comes from the past. It's a brilliant place to be, in fact, a very privileged place to be. So we learn from the past, we learn from the present, and we learn from ourselves, or oneself, and we project this synthetic thinking into the future as we design. There is no blank sheet of paper, as I just explained. You come with stuff in your brain. You've been influenced. You have a cultural context within which you're working. All of that precludes a blank piece of paper, whether to write on or whether to draw upon. I could talk endlessly about avoiding mistakes, making them, making mistakes, and how one deals with those things as a professional. But one thing is true in the world of the art of architecture in the same way it is in the art of being an artist. One learns from others, one is taught by other people, and you spend your younger professional career escaping from those masters, if you were lucky to have a good master. And eventually you mature and you feel you can express what architecture means to you and to your attitude towards society. And once you have done that a few times, you then become an uncle. Um, you become slightly wiser and you now give back to the younger generation. And it's an obligation to do so. It's a responsibility of a mature person to give back that knowledge, that experience, which is impossible to give because you've only lived it yourself. But the knowledge from that experience is vital to pass on. So escaping your master is an aspect which 
I enjoyed, in fact. But architecture, people often think it's like lived-in sculpture. Well, in a slightly amusing way, you could say that architecture has toilets on the inside, or one goes to the toilet on the inside, and sculpture, people often use them as toilets on the outside. So in another way of putting it, architecture tends to have plumbing. Sculpture rarely has plumbing. And of course, sculpture has no purpose, really. But the expression contained within that work of art does carry meaning. And that meaning lies within your mind, not necessarily the artist's mind anymore. And the techniques in architecture are vast. We have a pen, our minds, words, charcoal, paint, computer software, VR. Beyond VR, when you can share a new type of spatial environment and not have to wear goggles, that will come soon. And we have form and form finding using techniques as basic as string through to, again, sophisticated software and nonlinear geometry. We design from the user's perspective. How is somebody going to use a building? A day in the life of the cleaner, a day in the life of the, the office worker, his boss, the receptionist, these are important to understand because they're all people who will use and live in spaces that you create. So it's important to understand to make that aspect easy, the functionality easy, so that the poetry that you can bring to spaces and to architecture can then surface and make them happy, hopefully. And we can design also from the urban perspective. I'm talking here from a Georgian house with Canary Wharf through the window. Two completely different approaches to urbanity. And then you have design expressed as an ego and picked up again by the media, um, marketed to create a whole industry, a media industry on the, on the back of architecture, of artists and musicians and others. And that's a world that is real today. So <clears throat> in a sense, apart from designing for society and being a servant of society, we have to genuinely understand how you design with nature, not against it, with the climate in mind, in other words, a proper understanding of the biosphere, then every thought you have has an impact. It will follow through somewhere. It may be rejected, but it will certainly have an impact. So your thoughts have to be clear, they have to be developed, and developed well. And in my world of architecture, we design with the laws of physics. We don't really try not necessarily to escape gravity, but to work with it. And we work with the overall biosphere in mind, as well as the local context in which one is designing a building. I personally design now with the mind in mind, because I spent the last 10 years working with and for neuroscientists and their desire to understand the mind so that we can draw on that knowledge to be able to design better buildings for people because we will understand how people's behavior, how their minds appreciate and understand space and moving through space better. They talk about collaboration and I wrote back in the 1990s, the Ten Commandments of Collaboration, the first of which is, do come without anything, no prejudice, no preconceptions in your mind. Very difficult to do, but vital if you're going to allow yourself to share ideas genuinely with others. I think of the ingredients of what makes architecture light is the first one is like the opium for the architect and shadow is its form and through light and the way that light enters building and shapes buildings and gives you the perception of space there's nothing more magical 
the natural light. And then, of course, you have all the technical side of architecture. Look at your own hand or your own arm and you can see it's got a skeletal structure underneath the structure. Um, it's got an envelope called your skin with all its senses in it. And between that, you've got a, a whole servicing environmental system of cough and heat, flow, blood. Um, so our bodies actually embody the nature of our, what architecture is in itself. We understand gravity when we stand up. We understand what happens if you kind of lean forward and you're about to fall over. Buildings are the same. We actually recognise buildings, architecture, because of our bodies, because of who we are physically. And I think remember that there's always one, more than one answer to any given problem. And that's the richness of the human mind, the imagination that enables us to be extraordinary animals on this planet. But I think fundamentally, the most important thing is to know that you are serving others. And that is one big gift that you can give society. And you are very privileged to have had the education or to get the education to become an architect and to not forget that aspect of it. Thank you.